right, here we go. First time going live in quite a while. All right, awesome. So, well, I'll get started as people come out of the uh, chat. Feel free to just start throwing your questions in. Um, so I decided to try and do something um, a little different with these new streams. Uh, effectively, what I'm going to do, I'm gonna just, just going to be following the same format as I do for the private lessons that I teach. And each week I'll have a different topic or topics, plural, based off what everybody wants to learn. But for this first one, I thought we would just start with uh, kind of my own little approach to starting new uh, pieces of music. So in this lesson, I've got a couple goals. Here's the lesson plan. As you can see, this is what I'm going to be following as I'm talking today. Uh, this will be available to download as a PDF. Uh, once the stream is done. I'll download it, I'll put it on a Google Drive or something, I'll just throw the link in the description of this video. But our goals are to focus on essentially just this approach of like breaking music into nine parameters and how you can use that to help tell a story, how you can use it to start a new piece. Um, as like I said, all of these are gonna, this uh, lesson plan will be available afterwards. It's got notes, it's got everything. Uh, and yeah, other than that, let's just kind of dive right into all this kind of topic. Uh, oh, <laughs> how's it going, Jack? All right, good to see you in the comments. All right, awesome. Um, so what we're going to do today is, like I said, we're going to talk about music as it has um, nine different parameters that you can use to start writing a new piece of music. The idea of the nine parameters is that writing music can be difficult, right? It's like trying to write a story or trying to paint a picture. If you're trying to think of the entire thing all at once, right from the start, it can very quickly become overwhelming. If you're writing a story, you need to come up with the characters, you need to have the setting, the time period, you've got to have all these things figured out and you have to understand what you want to say in your story before you can start writing. And music is very much the same way. You can get overwhelmed very quickly thinking about sound libraries, thinking about musicians if you want to have it performed live, about the kind of arrangement, the kind of key you want to work in, the kind of harmony. You can be really stressed if you're trying to create a finished product in one go. And instead, there's this kind of approach to breaking music into nine different parameters. Now, these parameters are tempo, timbre, texture, rhythm, register, dynamics, articulation, pitch, harmony, and is that all nine? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, it's all nine. So these are the nine parameters. Um, and it can really help when writing music is to first approach it as kind of hitting these nine check boxes before you start writing your music. So the idea behind this is pretty simple, all right? Step one, is you just want to start with your story in mind. Effectively, is there a character that you want to translate into music? Is there a story world? Is there an emotion? Essentially, take time to figure out what it is you're trying to say with your music. Now, there are different types of music where it's just abstract and you're doing music for its own sake. That's not really the kind of music that I'm into. Sorry, that was my phone. I love to view music as a method for telling stories. Um, and so I like to teach music as a method for telling stories. So I will always start with my story in mind, whether I'm writing a theme for a character, whether I'm writing a theme for a story in general, the story world, whether there's a particular emotion at the core of a theme that I need to write, I'll start by describing that first. And in future lessons, we can learn a couple tools that I have. I have, think I have a couple videos actually sharing a couple of my tools. But that's something we can talk about in the future. We're going to assume at this point that you have a story that you want to go with. So step two is really to, with all this information in mind, to address each of the nine parameters and brainstorm how they can be used to tell your story. All right, so start with tempo first, then kind of move on to timbre, whatever you want to do. We're going to go into each of these in a lot more detail in just a bit. I'm going to kind of share this process, and then I'm going to read some comments real quick to see if there are any questions, and then we'll kind of move on. But the very last step is essentially 
once you have addressed each of these nine parameters, you summarize your ideas into a single page. And essentially, this is the description of your music. When you tackle this, when you ask yourself all these questions appropriate for tempo, timbre, texture, rhythm, register, dynamics, articulation, pitch, and harmony, well, basically all those different parameters, uh, once you've described each of these in detail, you'll find that putting that together actually gives you a description of your music. You have an idea of what it needs to sound like, how it needs to develop, uh, how fast is it going to be? How many layers are there going to be? How important is the melody? How important is the orchestration? You'll have a very useful and specific description of what it is your music needs to accomplish, and not only what, but how it will accomplish that as well. And when you have this description of what your music will sound like, suddenly it becomes so much easier to actually go about writing it. And that's essentially what we are going to be focusing on today's lesson, is how do you actually go about describing these? How do you go about studying them, exploring them, and figuring out how to tell your story using these nine parameters? Now, before we start diving into these, I don't want to take a couple moments for to check the comments real quick. It's always great to see you, Jack. Orchestra guitar, this is going to really test my multitasking ability since I'm in the middle of working. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, hopefully, but you'll be able to come back and watch it later, too, hopefully. Uh, oh, awesome. How, Clyde? Good to see you as well. Um, great. So we've got a uh, couple of my students are on watching this. Hopefully, this is some great stuff for you guys to learn as well that we can go into more detail on the lessons. But for now, let's get started. So we've got all of this kind of figured out. I'm not going to delete anything. I'm just going to make a line and then keep going lower. So the idea, let's start with this first one. All right. Our first idea is tempo. All right. So tempo as a parameter is essentially the most basic level that you can use to manipulate energy in your music. And essentially, we're gonna, as we start to study each of these nine parameters, we're gonna find out that some of them are really good for manipulating the energy. Others are much, much better aimed at determining the actual personality and the overall vibe of your music, and what makes it unique. And then a couple of them are actually gonna be great tools for manipulating both. But tempo, this first one, is essentially your greatest, single most powerful tool for manipulating energy right up there with rhythm, which we'll be talking about in just a bit. Now, with tempo, the idea for your energy is essentially pretty basic, super fast tempo equals super high energy. Super slow tempos also equal super slow energy. Now, when I say super fast, I'm saying somewhere about 160 plus BPM, all right? If we wanted to go with super slow, we'd say around uh, 60 BPM or lower. Somewhere neutral would be about like 110, and you can kind of play around here. Um, but the idea is that at the very simple level, your beat and how quick your beat is counted is going to determine the core energy level of your music. Now, if it were as simple as that, this would be very quick. We could just pick a tempo and move on but there is something else that gets involved here. Now we've talked about beats per minute. Essentially, this is just the metronome. So we've got Cubase open here. Let's open uh, our metronome. Right now our beats per minute is 120 BPM. Uh, so if we listen to the BPM, the metronome, if it will, why is it not playing? Huh, why? So we can hear the, we can hear the piano. Uh, why can't we hear the metronome? Ah, it's always something with technology, isn't it? Let's see if we can fix this real quick. Um, actually, you know what? No, we'll leave it. Now, the idea here is we can just add this this way. We will start with our 16th triplets. What was I writing? All right, so we've got whole notes. Let's go to quarter notes. We'll lower down all the velocity so it's a bit softer, not so grating, and we have a beat of 120 beats per minute. It's soft, but you can hear it. Now, 
we can have something 120, we can go something a little more neutral around 100, which is what we're gonna start with. And then we'll start to explore something which is called pulse. Now, the pulse of your music is essentially how this beat is felt. All right, and tempo does have two things. There is one, the beat, and there is two, the pulse. Now, this becomes most uh, kind of easy to conceptualize when you think about different meters. So simple meters like four, four time, and three, four time are counted where one beat equals one pulse. So it goes one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now, if you were to do something more complicated, something called a compound meter, this is where suddenly things are counted differently. You might have, for example, 12 eight as your meter, in which case you have 12 beats per measure and eight, well, one, an eighth note gets one beat. Now that can be very difficult and tricky to count, trying to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Trying to do that over and over and over again. So instead of that, Musicians will do something where they will count the pulse instead of the beat. And in most compound meters, the pulse is three beats for one pulse. So instead of counting each beat, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, you go one and a, two and a, three and a, four and a, two and a, two and a, three and a, four and a, and you count each measure. Now, this can be a little difficult to conceptualize, and don't worry about that. I'm kind of going off the little deep end here. I'm gonna pull it back. You don't need to know the like the tricky aspects of pulse versus beat. What's really important here is just the idea that the types of notes you use versus your beat are going to help manipulate the energy. So let's say we have these notes down here. They are our beat. They count one beat. So we have 100 beats per minute. And then up here, let's say we have a simple little melody. Oops, let's start over here. And in our melody, we have essentially just all of these are going to be half notes or longer. So the notes are all pretty much longer than our beat. So we end up with a very kind of low energy. Even though the beats per minute has not changed, it has remained 100 beats per minute, we have a very low energy because the interpretation of our beat, the types of notes we're using, are significantly slower. Now, if we were to suddenly change this, let's say we've got quarter notes for our beat, let's try to do a melody. Let's do... Why is it jumping all over the place? Where is my quantize at? Um, let's see here. What is going on here? Here we go. Here we go. Grid. Dun, 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 dun. All right, so this is going to be a really weird melody, but let's just listen to it real quick. All right, so now what we have is we're using much quicker notes, so we get a much faster energy. Now, this is something that can be very interesting to experiment with different pieces of music you listen to. My favorite example I like to bring up about using pulse to tell a story in your music is from Attack on Titan with the piece Vogel im Kaffee. Now, if you've listened to this piece before, I'm not going to pull it up because then I'll get all kinds of copyright issues. But uh, you have a very slow kind of hymn-like melody. Just something moving very slowly with longer notes. It's sung by a female vocalist. But underneath that, we have this rapid fire ostinato being played in the strings. And that creates this contrast behind a very slow moving melody and a very fast moving articulation of an ostinato in the background. And so this idea that you can use different interpretations of your beat, one layer of your music going slow, one layer going fast, to kind of help tell a story and manipulate the different energies. Now, I'm hoping this is making sense. Um, this is th this concept of tempo and of this beat versus pulse can be a little difficult to explain if I'm not able to hear questions back and forth while talking. So, 
If you have any questions while I'm just kind of lecturing up here, please, please post them in the comments. I'd be more than happy to answer them to kind of derail my plan and talk about other stuff, whatever is most useful to each of you. But so in general, we now essentially have an idea of tempo consisting of both your pulse and your beat. Not only how are you counting your beats versus your traditional tempo, but how are you portraying your beats using your pulse? Now, if we continue on with our conversation of these nine parameters, the next one we will talk about is going to be rhythm, which is very, very closely related to tempo here. Ah, I forgot to actually bring up one more thing on tempo, and that is that each of these uh, parameters, I have a series of questions that I like to ask, and that's what makes this process useful, is when you're trying to kind of explore how tempo can tell your story. Uh, I have three questions that you can ask yourself to kind of take notes and figure out how are you going to use tempo for your music. The first question is how fast or slow uh, should your BPM be? And again, BPM is beats per minute. Remember that 60 is on the low end and 160 is on the super high end. Anywhere in between is pretty much fairly useful as tempo. The second question you can ask yourself is how should your pulse or pulses, if you want to use multiple, uh, relate to the BPM? And this is something that we're going to be talking about again in rhythm in just a moment. But the idea is like basically how fast is your average note? Is your average note faster than beat? Is it slower than the beat? Is it equal to the beat? And again, we'll be talking about this a bit in just a second, but the last one to consider is should the tempo increase or decrease at any point in your music? Now, these are three very basic kind of questions you can ask yourself as you're planning a piece. Again, think, how can your tempo tell a story? Typically, this is one of the simpler aspects of your music you can listen to. You can say, all right, I just want a low energy. All right, so low tempo, low BPM. Or I want a super high energy, super high BPM. Um, whatever you want to do, don't need to spend too much time on this, but it can be helpful to answer each of these questions. Now, when we're talking about rhythm, while tempo is the most minimal way that you can manipulate the energy in your music, um, rhythm is essentially your tool for making the most out of your tempo. This is essentially the length of the individual notes that you're going to use in your melody, if you're going to use it in your harmony, in your bass line, what have you. Now, the general role of your rhythm is two-part, all right? It helps manipulate the energy, the energy of your music, and it also helps determine your personality, generally the overall vibe. So this is one of those tools, one of those parameters I talked about earlier that has an impact on both energy and personality of your music. Now, energy-wise, you essentially have this idea that shorter notes equal higher energy. Longer notes equal lower energy. It's very simple. The idea is that the more fast notes you have, the higher your energy is going to be. The more long notes you have, the slower your, lower your energy is going to be. It's pretty simple, pretty basic, but yet it's something that you still want to consider because at the end of the day, this also has an impact on the end of a phrase. So the idea is, let's say you've got an eight-bar phrase, an eight-bar melodic idea. If you start with some relatively long notes, let's say quarter notes and half notes, then as that phrase develops, you start getting shorter and shorter. You start using eighth notes, then sixteenth notes, what have you. By going from longer notes at the beginning of a theme to shorter notes at the end, you are increasing the energy gradually as it goes. Now, if you do the opposite, if you start with faster, shorter notes at the beginning of a phrase and then gradually become slower or longer, then you gradually slow down the energy. Now, this is incredibly useful when you're trying to manipulate the story or energy levels of your music throughout a single piece. Let's say you start, you're writing 
a music for a theme. At the beginning of the scene is a high action sequence. And at the end, the hero finally escapes. They have a moment to breathe. And so as they translate and their breathing starts to level out and they're starting to calm down, you start to switch to slower and slower notes, slower and slower tempo, and it helps bring down the energy. Now this is pretty intuitive. Most musicians have this understanding to begin with. What isn't always as quick to notice is how it impacts the personality of your music. And here the idea is it has to do with accents. So for example, which notes you accent will have a tremendous impact on the energy or on the personality of your music. So the idea here is that in most music, 4-4 four, four time especially, you have this idea that each of the first and third beats in a measure are going to be slightly accented. And of those, the very first is going to be the most accented. So we have this natural cadence of notes sounding somewhat like this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Kind of going on and on. And this is very much kind of subliminal, especially in melodies. You'll find that as you're writing a melody, most modern melodies will tend to have the strongest notes on either beat one or beat three. Now these, by the strongest notes, that could be the highest pitch of the measure, it could be the longest note of the measure, it could just be a note that's on the underlying harmony. Whatever it is, the most important notes tend to be on these beats. And this is a very familiar, very reliable strategy. You can do that for every piece you ever write and it would work perfectly fine. However, one of the fastest ways that you can kind of throw that off is to change it. And that could be as simple as, say, put it on the offbeat or put it on, or when you have one measure normal, you switch the other one up and just kind of switch that pattern so it's no longer symmetrical. You no longer have the same accents into two mirroring measures. But the idea is that you can kind of manipulate which notes that you are going to emphasize in your melody, in your harmony, in your ostinati, whatever kind of layer you're working with in your music. And in general, um, we can say following a regular and symmetrical accent pattern in your music creates stability and familiarity. Working with, with irregular and or asymmetrical accent patterns will create tension and interest kind of like build a little more attention to your personality um let's see any questions all right awesome yeah yes uh jack yeah talking about balance and separation yes that is a topic that uh really does kind of come into a lot in music the idea of balancing familiarity and uh novelty um, yes, and that is something that we'll talk about in orchestration. I'm working on another orchestration series in a little bit. And those are two incredibly important uh, pillars for orchestration. Um, let me see here. So another aspect for personality, you can also work with different meters. Uh, meters also help influence the personality of your music. In general, 4-4 four four is the most common and reliable. And if you want to work with three, four time, um, be used any time you want to shake things up. Now, this is the most kind of fundamental approach. There are, of course, tons of different time signatures. You have compound meters like 12, 8, 6, 8. You have weird ones like 2 over 2. There's all kind of weird, interesting, and exotic time signatures out there that you can play around with. Personally, I love working with compound meters, which tend to have much more of a, uh, um, a triplet feel to them. Also, odd meters tend to have a combination of both simple and uh, compound meters. It's, there's a whole other world that you can kind of explore when you're looking at time signatures. Uh, but in general, this kind of guideline is going to work really well for you. 4-4 four, four should be your default. 3-4 can really be used anytime you want to shake things up. Now, just like with tempo, we do have a series of questions you can ask yourself about rhythm to figure out how are you going to use this parameter to help tell your story. 
the first question that we can rely on is where should the rhythmic emphasis be within your meter? We talked about having regular versus irregular, asymmetrical versus asymmetrical patterns, um, which brings up the next one. Will the rhythmic emphasis says be symmetrical or asymmetrical? Um, regular or irregular? You can also ask yourself how much syncopation should there be? What strategies will there be will be used used to create it? I cannot type today. So you can use things like simply just cutting uh, a beat early, adding rests. You can try using uh, dotted notes to lengthen things. The whole idea of syncopation is that your emphasis is anywhere other than where it's expected. So in, we've talked about how in a 4-4 time, uh, beats 1 and beats 3 are kind of viewed as the most important beats in the measure. These are the strong beats. So if we have a nice emphasis on that, let's fix, there we go. We have what we have that's nice traditional 1 and 2 and 3 and 4. One and two and three and four and. Now, if we change that up, let's say just by moving those over. Now, if we can bring that over, we can kind of play around a little bit with different sounds and we get this syncopated feel. This would be so much easier to demonstrate if my metronome was working, which for whatever reason, it's just not working. That's incredibly annoying. I wonder what happened. Um, but there are other questions we can ask. And again, please feel free to throw any questions you have in the comments here. I kind of get a little flush when I'm just chatting myself. I'm not used to this. I'm usually having questions when I'm teaching lessons. Um, let's see how much. So what kind of beat subdivisions will be predominant? Now this talks about, we talked about the pulse earlier. So are most of your notes going to be faster than your beat? Are most of them going to be slower than your beat? Are they going to be kind of neutral and match the beat? Basically, what's the fastest average note you're going to be working with? After this, we can start talking about how frequently, frequently um, will rhythmic patterns uh, repeat, if at all. So the idea is like, are you going to have a very repetitive music, like an ostinato or a lot of electronic music where it's the same idea repeating over and over again and just kind of the new th layers and sounds you add or subtract are going to be the most important? Or do you need something a little more lyrical, a little more melodic that develops over time? Um, then we have just two more questions. Uh, what kind of variation be introduced to each repetition to continue, uh, continue development? And what, and then of course number seven is, what kind of meter might be useful? So these essentially are just the seven different questions you can ask yourself when trying to explore how is rhythm going to help you tell your story? And honestly, rhythm is one of the most important parameters that you want to take your time exploring. Really take your time to answer each of these questions and figure out how can you best tell the story? How can you best bring your character to life? How can you best uh, create the emotion you're looking for? The reason why rhythm is so important is because as a parameter, it makes up half of melody. All right, now the other half of melody is pitch. All right, we have rhythm and pitch when combined are useful to make melody. And that brings us to this parameter of pitch, which I'm just going to put in parentheses is melody because essentially this is the type uh, of notes and strategies that you use to write your melody. Now, as a parameter, pitch is super important for manipulating the overall kind of personality of your music. Now, instead of getting lost rambling about this topic, I'm gonna try and switch up strategies here a little bit and instead skip straight to our questions and then we can kind of talk about them. Uh, the idea, the first one is what kind of chordal tone to non-chordal tone ratio will you use? Now, this is very important 
let's say that you're working with a nice harmony. All right, we're going from A minor to D minor to G major. All right, we have this nice little idea going. A minor, let's raise that. A minor, D minor, then G major. All right, if we focus on mostly chordal tones. You heard that kind of crunch, that that's because the G is not a chordal tone. D minor consists of D, F, and A. So if we go, if we add a note from outside of the chord, that's what really brings a lot of tension to the sound. And it's this idea that chordal tones, notes that belong to the melody, that was our original E, E and C, sorry, I tend to get quieter when I start playing. I gotta be mindful of that. E and C both belong. You know what, let's actually write these out. Let's say we have our chords. We have, we have an A minor, we have a D, and we have a G. Now we can use these three chords and we can stick to mostly chordal tones, which are the notes that belong under the harmony. Uh, these notes, E, A, and C, are all belonging to the chord beneath, so they're going to create a sense of stability, of familiarity and reliability. They're a very reliable sound. Now if we start to move around a little bit and go down to G, our first non-chordal tone. Non-chordal tones do not belong in the underlying chord. We see D minor, there's no G in D minor. And yet what this gives us is a little more kind of spice, a little more energy. And then I ran out of room out of my keyboard. All right, I need a larger keyboard. I've only got 25 keys. We have this idea that the G helps bring a bit more spice, a little more tension and color to the music. And essentially that's what that is. Uh, chordal tones, in general, chordal tones will provide uh, stability and function, while non-chordal tones will provide color and personality. Um, let's see, I got a couple questions here. What's the best way to figure out the time signature? Oh, time signature? Um, to find the best time signature, it's really, going back to, it's up to you. Uh, it's, I wish I could give something a little more clear cut um, when you are just kind of improvising, it can be a little bit difficult to find out which time signature actually fits what you improvised. But when you're planning ahead of time, it's, you can really choose it yourself. Now, like I said up here, the two easiest options is 4-4 as your default. The vast majority of modern music is written 4-4 time. And that's not because it's cliche. It's not because it's overused. It's because this makes sense to a lot of listeners. Most people, when listening to music, if it's written 4-4 time, it's familiar, it's reliable, and it's intuitive. And if it's intuitive, they're quicker to understand it and you're more likely to have your music be remembered and uh, kind of make it hummable. Three, four time is similar, just slightly different. So it's just as familiar, just not as common. So you can use it to create something a bit more exotic. Um, other than that, there are plenty of time signatures that you can explore and find your own uses for. Um, honestly, that's something that we could spend an entire lesson kind of talking about, but in general, don't overthink it too much is what I would say. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. Don't try to invent a crazy new time signature or find a weird, rare time signature, unless that's what you're going for. In general, these two can help perform the vast majority of anything you may need to write. Get used to working in these two first, then start exploring is what I would be recommended. Um... Uh, Me Melodyne is a good tool to find tempo. Oh, awesome! Thanks for sharing, Clyde. I'll have to check. Yeah. So if you're trying to, yeah, if you're trying to find the time a signature of a pre-existing piece, that tends to be a little more difficult and a little more complicated than just picking one to get started with. Um, I'd recommend checking out Melodyne. It is a fantastic tool. It's useful if you're trying to find one in an existing piece. But like I said, if you're writing, my tip: master these two first, then start exploring. Uh, awesome! Great. More suggestions from Jack. Thank you. 
Um, awesome. Great to see you, Aditya. Thanks for joining. I hope I pronounced your name right. I remember you, but I'm terrible at name pronunciation, so sorry about that. Um, okay, so back to this idea of pitch and finding different uh, uh, the different questions you can use to kind of figure out your melody before you write it is how many color slash embellishing tones will you use uh, and what types. Now, if you've seen my video series on writing melodies, basically you'll find out that color and embellishing tones are those non-chordal tones that I was talking about. The idea of these notes, how G does not belong in the underlying melody. Uh, if we wanted to, you can also add them in between to essentially bridge different parts together. So if we were going to cut this, we could kind of just close the gap a little bit. G does not belong to A minor, but it's short, it's not emphasized, and it helps bridge these two notes together. So instead of, we now have this idea of, and then we could go to D. And these kind of embellishing notes, notes that don't belong in the underlying harmony, will help transition from one chordal tone to another, help give kind of personality. Again, if we were to follow just these chordal tones, if we were to add some, if we add these embellishing tones, it has a lot more personality. Now, there are many different types. Again, I don't really have time to get into a lot of them. I do have videos on this in my melody uh, playlist. So feel free to check those out. Right now, we're kind of just focusing entirely on exploring these different parameters. So unfortunately, my discussion on each individual uh, parameter is going to be a little lacking. Just a quick cursory look. Um, but in general, so the next question, uh, are there any specific intervals that you want, that you want to make use of? Now this just comes down, there are all kinds of different personalities between intervals. For example, you've got the perfect fifth and perfect fourth. Let's go down an octave. That idea that they have a very open, very kind of heroic quality to them. Now the idea that you have other ones like a minor sixth or major sixth has kind of like this kind of lyrical kind of plaintive sound to it. If you go to a minor sixth, it has a lot more like emotion, a lot more gut wrenching idea. Now this is a concept that people tend to overemphasize. Um, I wouldn't really focus on trying to find a sp series of like sequential important intervals that you want to follow one right after the other. The idea here is just trying to figure out the general types. Do you want to work with mostly leaps? Do you want to work with mostly steps? And we're going to talk about that in just a second. Or for this one, really, is there one particular interval that you just think is going to be important? Uh, so again, like those weird ones, like the minor sixth, tend to be very emotional, very unique, and very useful for kind of starting out a new motivic idea, but you can explore different ones. My just word of caution would be not to overemphasize it. So our next question you can ask, we've only got two more, what kind of contour uh, shape will you use? Now the contour is essentially just the shape of your melody, all right? Does it move up? Does it move down? Is it conjunct or disjunct? Now these two words are fancy little terms of music theory. All they mean is, are you going to move mostly by step? Or are you going to move mostly by large leaps? So basically, are you moving up? Are you moving down? Do you want to move mostly by stepwise movement, which is more lyrical? Do you want to move by large leaps, which is more kind of grand and majestic? Um, these are just the kind of things to help try to brainstorm the general personality and feel of your melody and what you plan on doing with it. And then the last question is just, will you be using a counter melody? And again, these five questions are just kind of pretty simple. The idea is just to start brainstorming again with a step one, start with the story you want to tell, whether that's a character, a story, a world, a particular emotional experience, what are you trying to capture in your music? And then when it comes to pitch, just start figuring out how can you use your melody to describe this story, to actually tell it. Now these five questions are designed to help get you started. Maybe some of them will be useful, maybe not. Uh, maybe you have uh, questions I haven't come up with myself. 
But I always try to address each of these five questions anytime I'm writing any kind of melody to try and get my brain moving and try to put up some creative boundaries that can help me be more productive. It's I like to use the analogy that if you go into a supermarket and you go in like a cereal aisle and you've got hundreds of cereals, it can be overwhelming to try and... Uh, um, you can just be very like, or to try and pick one specific type that you want. But if you've only got like a small little mom and pop shop and there's like three or four cereal brands, that's much easier. That's really what this process is about is trying to limit the number of options you have available to you. And, oh, wow. Awesome. All right. My first super chat. Thank you. Orchestra of Guitars. Uh, your book is amazing and I've learned a bunch in the past few weeks from it. Any other books you would recommend for beginner theory learners? Wonderful. Thank you so, so very much. I appreciate it. I have put so much work into that book and I'm super excited to be getting it published. For those of you who didn't get a chance to purchase it during August, um, I, I've kind of been procrastinating. I'm a little lazy and I have not taken it off my website yet. So I haven't announced that because I was supposed to take it down at the end of August. That was the plan. I've just been busy. So if you are interested, please feel free, grab it. If you purchase it before I take it down, of course your name's going to go in the book, so thank you. Um, but yeah, I, it's just there's no long guarantee how long it's going to be up there. I'm going to get to it eventually. I promise I will, but thank you. Uh, as to your question, any books that I would recommend, I actually have a video on this. I have a video on my favorite books, but right off the bat, the first one that comes to mind is uh, Reharmonization Strategies. All right, uh, by Randy Feltz. It's a book um, from the Berkeley Press with an incredible introduction to different reharmonization, reharmonization strategies. Essentially, how do you start with one chord progression and then keep developing it, adding changes, making it more interesting, making it fit different situations a little bit better. It is a fantastic resource for anyone looking to do uh, more with their harmony. Now, of course... Um, I also have to recommend Alan Belkin's uh, Music, Composition, Craft, and Art. Uh, it's a fantastic book. The little caveat to that one is I've been told by a lot of people who get it after my recommendation it's a little dry to read. And I'll agree. It's, it, it's a little dry. It's a little academic. Um, the author is an incredibly, incredibly accomplished academic like professor, studied at Yale, teaches at Juilliard, all kinds of stuff. So he's, he isn't always the most dynamic author, but the information he has to offer is invaluable if you're able to push through that. Um, yeah, so thank you very much, Orchestra of Guitars. I really appreciate your support. That's exciting. Thank you. Um, yes, yes, Clyde, thank you. Yes, Reharmonization is a fantastic book. All right, uh, Jack, how many times do you typically do the nine parameters for one of your projects, whether it be personal, a commission, or a small film? Does it change depending on the size of the project? Um... So this is my initial step. So I would say every single project I ever write, I always do this at least once uh, per piece of music. Um, after that, I don't rely on it too much uh, because this is really a tool to get me started. The idea is this tool helps me push past writer's block to kind of get past that initial fear of, holy crap, I've been hired to write this theme for a character. I've got no idea where to get started. All right, how am I, like, instead of banging my head against the keyboard and trying to come up with something that works, um, I have this tool to rely on, to kind of spend some time studying the characters the, or the themes or whatever I'm supposed to be translating to music, and then really kind of iron out some ideas one detail at a time. Um, now, we are running short. We only have like 15 minutes left, so I might not get through all of these. I want to say as a reminder to anyone on now, I'm going to be sharing all my notes. All right, this is my lesson plan. This is what I do for all the lessons with my students is every lesson comes with a lesson plan. It controls the goals, what we wanted to learn, a check-in, and then, of course, all the notes, everything I'm basically referencing as I teach. Uh, it started out as just kind of bullet points that I would use to remind myself what to say, like what to address in each lesson. But as time went on, I started being asked to include notes with it as well. So now this is just kind of the finished product is... Uh, for every lesson, I include all the notes so that you can use this as a resource to review the content after the lesson, if you so choose. So no worries if we don't get into it right away. Uh, but yeah, this I'll be posting that as a PDF after the stream is ended. Uh, let's see. Ah, here we are. So that's pitch, but let's keep moving on. As usual, though, if you do have questions, please, this 
lesson plan. I don't need to stick to the lesson plan. Whatever is most useful to you guys, please pop it in the comments, as well as anything you'd like to see in the future. I am go The plan is to do one of these live lessons every week for the foreseeable future. So if there's any topic, whether you want to, for example, go into reharmonization, or if there's a particular section of the orchestra you want to learn how to write for, if you want to learn more about melody writing, anything that you're curious about, uh, this is an opportunity to essentially have free private lessons. Uh, I understand that private lessons can be expensive and not everyone can receive them. I myself was not able to afford private lessons for really anything uh, music related. And I had, was incredibly blessed and fortunate to meet an incredible mentor and teacher of mine in school. And she was really the first person to believe in me and say, you know what, you've got something here. I want to help you. And she offered me free lessons for quite a while. And that helped me grow tremendously as a musician. And so that's something I'm trying to offer a little bit here. Uh, it's just these live streams of whatever you guys are trying to help, uh, learn. And I'm just kind of starting with this initial topic to get started with. Uh, yes, <laughs> I'm glad. All right, uh, every week, yes, every week I'll be doing it every week, hopefully. I mean, I might have some weeks where I have to take off, but uh, because I'm not home or whatever. But yeah, that is the plan, is to essentially just do a lesson every week with you guys. Um, so the next one is articulation, which is essentially how your sounds are articulated. Uh, what te playing techniques techniques are used. In other words, what accent is your story being told with? So are you using short, crisp notes? Are you using long, lyrical kind of phrases? Um, the idea is just kind of try to add a little bit of personality to your sound. Now, understanding which articulations and playing techniques are available to you is something that comes with time. You have to study the different instruments, how they're played, how you can write for them. Um, but in general, there are two questions I like to always ask, even before I know what instruments I'm working with. And that is essentially what kind of articulations could belong in the music and what kind of performance techniques could benefit the music. And this basically goes back to those examples I said. Do I want short, crisp notes? Do I want long, lyrical ones? Do I want a combination of the two? Uh, whatever it is, and then techniques, if this is a string orchestra, maybe I want to try performing soltasto or sol ponticello or maybe pizzicato, all these different techniques available to string players. And really, it's just the opportunity to try and kind of uh, brainstorm what kind of sound you want to create to help tell your story. Now, being 100% honest, articulation, this one is probably one of the weakest parameters I rely on. Um, maybe it's not for you, but just for me personally, if I'm going to skip a parameter, this is probably one of them that I gl gl uh, glaze over. Because that is something important to note is I don't always address each of these parameters for every single theme I write. Sometimes I just do tempo, rhythm, melody, and harmony. Those are the only ones that I focus on. Or if I'm being pressed for time, or if maybe timbre is super important, then I really focus on the tone colors I'm going to use. Every project is a little different. It's really about trying to find which of these parameters inspire me the most on whatever given project I have. Which ones are giving me the most ideas and getting me the most excited to write. Uh, let's see, I really appreciate this initiative. I'll try and make it to every lesson. Awesome, thank you, Matia, I appreciate it. Uh, hopefully I'll be seeing you, yeah. Um, let's see, harmony is the next one, which is essentially how different pitches are played together to create uh, context and color for your melody slash music. Now, harmony really has three primary responsibilities. It helps manipulate the energy of your music based off how much dissonance you use and how many chords you cram in a single measure. Uh, it can manipulate the personality through the keys, the modes, the different types of chords. For example, are you using, uh, for example, we could go C major, B minor, and A minor has a very different sound if we turn them all into sevenths. All right, so the idea of just the very types of chords you use can have a tremendous impact on the overall vibe of your music. Now, since we are running short on time, I'm going to start going straight into these questions, uh, which is what scale, type, or key 
do you plan to use? So are you working with a major key, a minor key? Are you going modal and trying something Dorian? It's like D minor with a major, with a raised fourth or raised sixth, I should say. That, by the way, is one of my absolute all-time favorite sounds in music, is the minor one to major four. If you followed my film scoring series that I released a few months ago, if you follow the final project I did for the competition, you'll see that's a very prominent chord relationship in my music. I love it. It gives me goosebumps every time. Uh, and hopefully will for quite a while, and I won't get bored of it by overusing it. Uh, but you can also ask how much... Dissonance do you want to use? Uh, what kind of harmonic, oops, let me add a three there. What kind of harmonic rhythm uh, do you plan on using? Which is essentially how many chords per measure. Uh, in general, one chord per measure is the average. If you start increasing that number, it starts increasing the energy. If you start decreasing it and do like one measure every, uh, have one chord every couple of measures, it will rapidly decrease the energy of your music. A general rule of thumb is always go with one per measure to start with. If you want to create more of a soundscape ethereal, then go for fewer chords per measure. If you want to do much more high energy kind of action stuff, then more chords per measure can be helpful. Um, and there are lots of strategies on how to cram more chords in. Uh, I plan on doing some reharmonization videos in the future, but if you cannot wait, that book I recommended earlier, Reharmonization by Randy Feltz, is an incredibly useful uh, resource. And so is my book, which I, uh, which thanks to uh, Orchestral Guitars, uh, Orchestra of Guitars, uh, I mentioned earlier, I have been too lazy to take down from the website yet. I had announced I took it down, uh, but I was away from home all weekend and. I was, I was kind of like on vacation and I didn't want to do any work over the weekend. So yeah, I, I'm going to take it down. I'm going to take it down soon. I know I'm supposed to because I need to start working on the uh, updates. But if all that to say, it's still up there for a time being. If you're still interested and haven't grabbed it yet, go for it before I take it down because I do eventually need to submit it to get it published. Uh, let's see here. What kind of harmonic rhythm do you plan on using? Okay, so what chord types? Again, the idea that a triad sounds different from a seventh, which sounds different from an extended chord. And if you're interested in learning a lot more about harmony, I do have a playlist on harmony for composers that covers quite a bit of useful information that you may enjoy. Uh, you can also ask what type of harmony, speaking of that playlist, because it covers both. You can have functional versus non-functional harmony. And then the last question is, what types of cadences do you plan on using and where? And if that is something you are not familiar with, I literally just released a short three minute video yesterday detailing the four, I think like the three or four most common types of cadences, not only how to make them, but when and where to use them. So after this, I'm going to just quickly run through the final parameters and their questions. I wish I had more time to go in depth on these. Uh, timbre is essentially your tone colors. Um, and again, don't worry, I've got notes on all of these. So all the stuff I wasn't able to come through, talk about. For my lesson plan, I'll be sharing this after the video in the description or maybe a comment. Uh, each of these have a general role, basically what they're used for in your music. And then for those that have multiple roles, I have basically descriptions on how they fill that role. And then, of course, the questions that you can use to help consider carefully how to use them to tell your story. Um, so we'll go with timbre. Um, you know what? I'm going to do these questions, then I'll probably end this discussion on the parameters and do a couple minutes of just questions. So if you have any questions you want me to address before the end of the stream, Now's the time to put them in the comments. I will address every question that gets posted uh, before logging off. So let's see. Uh, for timbre, basically how many sound palettes do you need and why? So a sound palette is essentially a collection of instruments that you're going to use uh, to help tell the story. So let's say you... Uh, my favorite example, again, comes from Raya the Last Dragon. I think I've shared this in a few videos. A uh, movie that came out a couple years ago. It was an okay movie. I enjoyed it. Not my favorite, but the music strategy kind of was breathtaking to me. There were three distinct sound palettes. The first one was essentially a collection of South Asian 
uh, Southeast Asian instruments. And that was used as the core of all the music. It was used to establish a setting. It was used to establish a general vibe and personality of the music. And that was sound palette number one, applied pretty much in any situation you need. Sound palette two was the same thing. All of those indigenous instruments, but with an orchestra added. And that sound palette was used any time in the movie where there was a particularly strong emotion. Just because the orchestra, thanks to hundreds of years of context we have for it, is unrivaled in its ability to kind of enhance emotions. Then the third and final sound palette was the same thing. Orchestra, indigenous instruments, and a female vocalist. And she was used very specifically for a very specific thematic idea for the story which is kind of like the, the indomitable spirit of the United Peoples in the story world. The idea is essentially how many different specific collections of instruments do you need to help tell your story. And again, if you want to learn more about sound palettes, I do have a playlist on film scoring that I just finished up a few months ago. There is a whole video on them and how to design them, essentially. Uh, but then the other questions are what instruments should you use? Uh, what size instrumentation works best? I forgot to add the three, but we're running out of time. What performer or sound library do you want to work with? Then uh, what kind of space should it be recorded in? In other words, what kind of reverb do you want to use? Uh, let's see. What types of microphones? I keep forgetting the numbers here. Uh, what type of microphone? So essentially, do you want a close mic, which gives you a lot more detail, or a tree mic that gives you a more realistic sound as part of an ensemble? I'll be doing a video in the future on what types of mics there are and when to use each one. I have it listed on as one of my like short, quick theory videos that I recently started doing. Uh, that I want to share with all of you. But uh, last question, and what techniques should be used to make the recording? And that, again, could go down mostly to like sound libraries. So things like um, Spitfire Studio Orchestra focuses a lot on creating the most realistic sound for where each instrument would be placed. Things like Metropolis Arc series from uh, Orchestral Tools focuses less on realism and more on a particular power. So instead of having four bases, as might be normal, uh, they'll say, all right, we have 12 bases. And on that, we have them doubling with uh, 18 contra bases beneath that to go even lower, even more powerful kind of idea. So it's really kind of thinking about what kind of general sound are you looking for? Now, unfortunately, I do have a couple more that I would like to do, but we have run out of time. Um, don't worry, I'll be sharing the lesson plan with all the notes after this. The last thing I'm going to do is every lesson I do, I share homework, essentially, or recommended um, basic uh, exercises that you can do. And here I have two of them, all right? The first is to come up with a story, all right? Or maybe you have a character that you love. Maybe you have a video game or a manga or a book that you're reading. Anything with a character that you love. Maybe it's a D&D &D character that you've developed. Uh, come up with a character, a story, and a world, an emotion, something. Familiarize yourself with what it is you want to translate into music, and then try applying all of these questions, all of these tools and parameters to create a summary of what your music should sound like. And then once you have that resulting description, uh, try to use it to kickstart your writing process for that new piece of music. And then the second assignment is share a comment on this video or shoot me an email or send me a message on Instagram. I'm trying to get more active on there. Whatever it is, find a way to contact me. I've got several. Um, and tell me what you want to learn. All right, what do you want to see in these live videos? What do you, what is it, is it orchestration? Is it harmony, melody writing? Uh, I've been learning a lot about synths, so I can't teach a lot about that, but I'm getting there. So maybe you want to learn about some different things I've been learning about that. Anything, everything music related, let me know. I am more than happy to talk about it in the videos. Now, before we sign off, let's take a look at some of these questions. Let's see. Let's say, uh, Matia, 
I'd say that uh, articulation comes naturally depending on the part of the track. After split, you shouldn't write an ostinato with long articulations. Exactly. Uh, now, again, that's something where I don't really worry too much about articulation. It, especially the more experience you have, you start to learn a lot about how to actually uh, basically trust your gut and figure out how something should be played. Um, ostinati are very frequently used with very short, crisp ideas, but there are some genres where they're a lot more fluid and used for kind of like a almost like a melodic fill kind of in the background. So it does depend. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Uh, you listen to an orchestral performance. Uh, Aditya. Uh, um, I listened to an orchestral performance. It was by Genshin Impact Sumeru. It's very good. It had one. It had one and ideas and the rest was counter melody. It had one idea and the rest was counter melody and fills and runs. I wonder how many melodies you could fit. Um, that's a fantastic point. So any individual theme can have multiple motivic ideas, multiple melodies. Now, in general, I would say stick to one or two, depending on the style. Um, if you're going to have more than two, because if you have one theme, if you have one melody and just repeat it over and over again, it can get very boring unless you're adding a lot of other new stuff. If you have two melodies, you can basically start with your primary melody, go to your new melody, then return to your primary melody. That's a very common strategy, especially in songwriting. You'll notice that usually the verses and refrain of a song will have their own unique melodic idea. And that coupled with the changing lyrics helps to establish a bit of variation and make the song sound complete. Uh, but there, all are, there are other strategies. If you watch my video on studying the music from Skyrim, you'll see how rondo form, which the idea is you have one repeating melody, like a primary melody. You play it once, then you play a new melody, then you repeat the original melody, then you play another completely different melody before repeating the original primary melody. That's a strategy you can use to basically keep sandwiching completely new ideas with uh, a familiar, comforting, kind of reliable, repeating melody to help give it a bit more structure. Uh, but honestly, it really comes down to what kind of story you want to tell. Honestly, that's something you'd want to take some time to think, how many melodies do I need to actually tell the story? How many themes do I need to actually tell the story I have? And at this point, I feel like I'm rambling on the topic. So sorry if I am. But uh, yeah, so that'd be something that I wish I could tell you. There's like a formula to tell you exactly how many themes you need to write for a single piece. But it really comes down to just how you want to tell your story. Um, uh, Harmony for Composers is incredibly... Ah, thank you, Jack. Yes, that's... Uh, Honestly, one of my playlists that I'm most proud of is the Harmony for Composers. That was the first one where I really felt like I started to hit my stride and kind of emphasizing the things I want to emphasize. Uh, Composer, yep, I'm going to have to revisit it if it's been a while. Awesome, thanks, buddy. I hope you enjoy the videos the second time through. Uh, Francis, thank you. This is awesome. Wonderful. Thank you, Francis. I'm glad to help. And look at that. We've got the sex bots in the comments. That's almost kind of like a... An accomplishment almost the stream got large enough to get the attention of the spam bots so I'm just gonna remove these real quick we are almost to the end of the comments at the end of the questions if you have anything please throw it in the comments I'd love to answer them before we log off um, let's see you previously did some character theme streams would you love to see those make a comeback uh, yes, or the live composing yes I would like to do more of those in the future the tricky part with that sorry, I'm rubbing my eye, is I found that it was really slowing down my actual process. The process of, like, the pressure of being live and composing ended up kind of changing things up a little bit. If I were to do it, I don't see why not. Um, I, e I tried emailing the person. I've been having difficulty emailing the person who uh, uh, was a uh, one of the earliest patrons I ever had. Wonderful supporter. I'm forever grateful. Um, uh Declan, if you're out there, you know I still appreciate you. I tried emailing you. I tried getting a hold of you to send you the mix of the music as well as some other information. Uh, I don't think you've gotten the email yet. So if you do end up watching this, please shoot me an email. I want to get in contact with about you about getting the rest of the music that I feel I owe you for that series. Because uh, unfortunately, I will not be doing the rest of the series live, but I will be writing those pieces. And I am currently writing those pieces. I need to get those to you. So uh, hopefully if you see this, email me. Uh, back to the comments. Um, oh yeah, so yeah, Jack. Yeah, I, I could see those coming back, but in, for the most part, I think right now I'm going to focus mostly on these live lessons. 
Uh, Matia, regarding synths, it would be cool to maybe do a lesson about possibly integrating synths and orchestral sections. Which ones can go together for the better? Good question. That would be really fun. I really do think. I have been spending a lot of time studying synths. And kind of the way I learn, I love learning by teaching. And so this entire time that I've kind of been studying synthesizers. I've Because I took courses with Berkeley and I learned a lot. But for whatever reason, I just never took. It wasn't until I saw an advertisement for Centorial on Ryan Leach's channel. If you haven't discovered Ryan Leach, I don't, I don't know if you... It, it'd be weird if you found my channel and not Ryan's, because his channel is much larger than mine. But if you if you haven't, Ryan Leach's channel is incredible. I cannot recommend it highly enough. Um, but he did an ad for Centorial in a lot of his videos, and I checked it out, and it has been doing wonders for teaching me. And I am already kind of like planning a series on teaching synthesizers, and uh, taking all this information that I'm finally starting to understand, and you know, kind of putting my own spin on it and teaching it with my own style. So. We'll see that that probably won't be for a while but um that'd be great i would love to do some videos on hybrid styles of music because that is incredibly important especially for modern trailer music uh matt thank you wonderful thank you um can see joao sup dude taking a break from arranging orchestras for metal to see your lesson but it's going to be helping you understand. wonderful thank you i really hope it does um again if there's anything you'd like to see me touch in the future please let me know i'd be more than happy to discuss it uh, Edwin, is this recorded? Yes, yes, this is uh, the stream, unless something went wrong, should be available as a video after this ends. And in the video, I will again be adding these notes as a downloadable PDF so that you can revisit all the topics at your own, uh, at your own pace, kind of take things that are useful, reject things that aren't. That's one of my favorite quotes by Bruce Lee. Um, and yeah, so yeah, don't worry, it should all be available. Uh, let's see, Matt Lewis, arranging for strings, live stream would be great. Fantastic. Awesome. I don't see anything else. So unless there's something else that comes up, um, that I feel like uh, that people are more popular that let's just plan on that next week. The lesson will be about arranging music for strings. Um, if anyone is feeling particularly adventurous and wants to send me eight bars of MIDI music or eight bars of like sheet music that you have written and would love to see arranged for strings, send it my way. That would save me a lot of trouble having to just write something on the fly for this. But if not, no worries, no pressure. I can do it myself, no problem. Uh, but yeah, so that sounds like next week I will do a video live stream lesson on how to write or arrange music for strings, which really is a very fun topic. Uh, I love orchestration and music. You'll, you, if you watch my channel for a while, you'll know that harmony and orchestration are my two absolute favorite topics to study and work with in music comp. Now, with that, this lesson has already gone about a little over eight um, minutes in length. So, uh, or, well, way longer than eight minutes. I should say eight minutes longer than I was expecting. So, yeah, as usual. Feel free to send me any questions, any suggestions, any comments, theories, ideas. I love hearing from all you guys. Thank you so much to my incredible patrons who make these videos possible. And as always, keep studying, keep working hard, and keep writing new music. I will see you all in the next live stream. Have a great day. Bye-bye.